uh, it's great to see you all here this afternoon, and I'm really delighted to spend a little time with you, uh, as Mr. G said this morning, helping to understand a little bit better what was going on in the rest of Virginia uh, and the statewide context uh, in this period from Bra the Brown decision in 1954 to the closing of the public schools in 1959. And so I really, we won't talk that much about Prince Edward. It's on sort of a different trajectory in many cases, and we can maybe kind of come back to that um, in sort of the, the conversation after my talk. I will say uh, I have a, a weakness as a history professor in that I can talk for a really long time, uh, much like Baptist preachers. So I will attempt to... Uh, if I speed up at the end, it's only because I've looked at my phone and know that uh, I've, or I'm seeing your eyes gently close in a, in a post-lunch nap. I ask my students at Longwood, I have lulled generations of them to sleep, so with my voice. So, so let's talk first about this term massive resistance and, and where it comes from. It, it is meant to describe the actions of white politicians and the Commonwealth uh, of Virginia's government, their actions to obstruct, circumvent, and delay the implementation of the Brown decision. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Attorney Staples, for uh, quoting that, uh, that piece from, from 2017 when we dedicated the Commonwealth of Attorneys uh, building, the Barbara Johns building, because it really sort of is this, was this symbolic moment uh, where kind of the tide turned in Virginia. I still claim that Harry Byrd's statue on Capitol Hill caused him to turn his head when we named the building uh, after Barbara Johns. You know, he's, if you've been there, uh, on one side is the Barbara Johns building, on the other side is the Civil Rights Memorial. So we have, we have flanked him, finally. Uh, it's Harry Flood Byrd, who was U.S. Senator from Virginia, who, gave, who coined the term massive resistance in February of 1956, he issued a statement from Washington where he said, quote, if we can organize the southern states for the massive resistance to this order, and he meant the brown order, I think that in time the rest of the country will realize that racial integration is not going to be accepted in the South. So Byrd, from the very beginning, even in his earlier statements, even um, right after the Brown decision in 54, was an ardent opponent to the Brown decision. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is in a minute. Now, for decades, if you read histories of massive resistance, it's predominantly told from the perspective of white politicians and Virginia officials. And it's told as a story of them responding to a federal judiciary that was overreaching, that they believed was violating their state's rights, uh, and really trampling on the rights of citizens to control their public schools. And particularly here in Virginia, um, they used that, that rhetoric to describe uh, what was happening. More recently, and thankfully, there's a number of scholars who have really started to look at the important actions of the NAACP in this period. Um, this includes scholars such as Patricia Sullivan in her 2009 book, Lift Every Voice, which is a, a great overview history of the NAACP, as well as scholars Brian Daughtery and Margaret Eds. Brian has written a book on the um, NAACP in Virginia and its implementation of Brown called Keep On Keeping On. And Margaret Eds, I hope um, you've had a chance to read her book about Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. My own research and work contributes to this vein of scholarship that focuses on the NAACP. And so what's clear and important to understand as we think about this history and this period is that white politicians here in Virginia are responding to the actions of African American citizens and the NAACP as they pushed to implement Brown. It really is an internal dynamic here in Virginia uh, that the rest of the South and the rest of the nation were watching at the time. <laughs> 
So today what I'd like to do is really help to understand, um, help us to kind of think about and understand and reflect on um, some context and background for understanding how massive resistance happened. Uh, and talk about that dynamic that occurred between the NAACP and state government officials in the mid-1950s. And then I'd like to end with just a few reflections of, of I think, what the period helps to teach us uh, and hopefully might provide some lessons or at least a little inspiration um, for us today. So those are sort of the three things I want to do. Um, so let's talk about context and, and the background of the period. Uh, and I believe, because uh, much of my work uh, focuses on the NAACP litigation campaign before Brown, I'm a firm believer that you really, in order to understand massive resistance, you have to understand the decade uh, before uh, the Brown decision in 54 to really understand what was happening here in Virginia. Certainly, Virginia was one of the chief arenas in which the national NAACP waged its battle against segregation and education. And central to this fight, and those of you who have heard me before know I love to talk about them, but central to this fight was a critical mass of highly trained and motivated lawyers who were committed to the NAACP and its goal of securing black people's citizenship rights. Uh, the number of lawyers in Virginia who, who were affiliated with the NAACP legal staff distinguished it from other southern states. In 1950, the Virginia legal staff of the NAACP had 12 attorneys. In contrast, in all of Louisiana, there were four black lawyers. And they were affiliated with the NAACP too. <laughs> um, but what it meant was we had a legal staff and an NAACP state conference that really spanned the state. These attorneys, and most notably Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson III, used the NAACP litigation campaign as an organizing vehicle through which African Americans struggled to achieve their first class citizenship rights. And this is an important point uh, that about the NAACP, is that often, um, and I, I see some scholars do this, that they sort of think about the NAACP given um, its, its reputation that it earned in 1960, or in the 1960s, as sort of the established civil rights organization, the national civil rights organization that had a hierarchical structure um, that, was, that was distinctive from newer civil rights organizations that popped up in the late 50s, early 60s, most notably the Southern Conference, or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And that they sort of portrayed NAACP as sort of the, the old guy who sort of wouldn't get with the times uh, in terms of direct action. What's clear is that the NAACP was deeply invested in black communities and that it was really doing things that these newer civil rights organizations were doing decades before uh, they even appeared on the scene. That it really is, um, um, it was, and I think continues to be, an organization that's responsive to the local needs of communities. And that the lawyers saw themselves not just as attorneys, but also as activists who were there to use the legal campaign to organize communities uh, to agitate on behalf of their citizenship rights. So Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson, really beginning in the late 30s, early 1940s, prior to World War II, helped to organize NAACP branches. They initiated legal challenges when called upon by local communities. They filed countless petitions and court documents, and they worked very closely with the national NAACP staff, most notably Thurgood Marshall. Oliver Hill and Thurgood Marshall were classmates at uh, Howard Law School. They were both trained by Charles Hamilton Houston, and they had a similar philosophy of, of what was the role of lawyers uh, and black lawyers to the freedom struggle of African Americans. Hill and Robinson themselves actually pioneered many of the techniques that the national NAACP adopted. And so Virginia was really um, a place of experiment, but it also was a sort of an initial kind of beachhead in the battle, if you will. Um, their work, Hill and Robinson's work, not only shaped the direction of civil rights activism in Virginia, 
but also proved essential to really shaping the national civil rights struggle. Um, and so this is also sort of my claim that Virginia uh, should stand alongside deep south states, Alabama, Georgia, um, in terms of a national civil rights history. So what happens here in Virginia in the late 40s, after World War II, is both the national NAACP and uh, the Virginia State Conference of the NAACP really kind of work together to try and advance this attack on segregated education. And the World War II context is really important. There was a huge demand for schools in the wake of World War II. And Thurgood Marshall understood this, noting how state governments were, uh, quote, making elaborate plans for education. He warned, quote, the policy of discrimination against Negroes will continue unless we move and move fast. And so the lawyers convened in a conference in Atlanta in 1946 to really try and hammer out a strategy of what they were going to do. And we know from, if you've read Histories of Brown, this is often referred to as the equalization phase of the road to Brown. And I just want to point out what's important to understand and sort of what that meant was essentially lawyers and black communities would school sue, bo or sue school boards to challenge the discrimination they faced um, in public education, in sort of particularly at the high school level they were looking at, but also having to do with bus transportation and teacher salaries. The NAACP never acknowledged the constitutionality of segregation. They never acknowledged that Plessy was constitutionally correct. Um, they never acknowledged that the equal was what they were ultimately striving for. What they were ultimately striving for, for was to dismantle segregation. Um, and so this campaign in the late 40s, where uh, Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson went into local communities and, and sued school boards, they, they had to do it in a particular way. They couldn't ask school boards and counties to equalize the schools, because that would essentially mean that they were uh, sort of acknowledging that Plessy was okay. Instead, what they did is they went and they had to ask school boards to stop discriminating against African American students. What this, and th so this becomes known as the Equalization Campaign. And uh, the Virginia State NAACP rolls this out in 1947. Uh, and Spotswood Robinson and their newly uh, hired executive secretary, W. Lester Banks, uh, takes the charge in going around to communities around Virginia to uh, assess their school conditions and to mobilize communities to challenge uh, the inequalities. Um, but it never was a case where sort of they were seeking equal educational opportunities, but they weren't sort of asking for separate but equal. Does that make sense in terms of, the, of what they were asking for in the courts? And there's a reason why I want to make that distinction. Um, because what it did was it left it up to local county officials and school board members to determine what equality meant. And this will cause some complications um, in the campaign. What's important to understand, uh, and this is where I, I just want to give a little history of the Virginia State Conference of Branches, uh, is that it was really poised to help sustain this widespread campaign. It was one of the strongest uh, state conferences in the nation. Um, it was founded in 1935. By 1941, it had 39 branches across the state, making it the largest state conference in the nation. By 1946, the conference had grown to 91 branches across Virginia with uh, almost 25,000 members, which was about 4% of the African American population in Virginia. Uh, so we're talking, and, and over the course of years, branches might be organized and operate, and then they sort of might um, kind of because leadership changed, they might have a, pop, a sort of membership dip and they might get reorganized. But it is this strength and network of branches across Virginia that made the, um, made the litigation campaign possible. So by June of 1948, Robinson and uh, Banks uh, have 
sort of this equalization program running in some 63 out of 100 school divisions in Virginia. Uh, where they where they sort of have and there's remarkable stories and I'm sure some of you in the room can tell them because you knew Lester Banks and, and Spotswood Robinson but they would drive around in their car with a typewriter in the back and type out these petitions and motions um, in the car to take into into county courthouses this really was a, a kind of a movement if you will an organizing movement by 1948, the NAACP started to win these cases in federal district court. So they had judges who were ruling in their favor and ordering counties to stop discriminating against African American children. Most notably, in the spring of 48, these cases were happening um, in Gloucester County, on the Middle Peninsula, in King George County, east of Fredericksburg, also in Surrey, and even in Chesterfield County, there was a teacher's salary case that was happening. These successes in the litigation campaign, remember it's early 19, it's spring of 1948, are coming at a really um, sort of hot and vibrant political time uh, it, for civil rights in both Virginia and nationally. So the spring of 1948 is when Oliver Hill wins uh, election to the Richmond City Council. So you have a real push to mobilize black voters in the state. And of course, the national presidential election in 1948, um, Truman came out with his presidential uh, report on civil rights in December of 47. African Americans are organizing in response to that report to push forward civil rights. In that spring, there was anti-segregation legislation introduced into the General Assembly in 48. And of course, then later that year, the National Democratic Party will split over the issue of civil rights. So you have the NAACP pushing, you have this really kind of hot, vibrant political context, and Virginia politicians begin to freak out because they see that they are on on sort of pushed back here uh, and that there's momentum building. Uh, and of course, for state politicians here in Virginia, they were members of Harry Byrd's democratic political machine. And I hope everyone knows this history um, about sort of what politics were like here in Virginia uh, during the era of segregation. Just to give you a hint, uh, there was a study of Southern politics in 1949 done by a political scientist named V.O. Key. And he labeled Virginia a political museum piece. He declared, of all the American states, Virginia can lay claim to the most thorough control by an oligarchy. And that was uh, Harry Floodbird. Of course, he was descended from some of the original founders of Virginia, the Floods and the Birds, uh, although he fancied himself a self-made man. Um, but his control over Democratic Party politics was extensive. He served as U.S. Senator from 1933 to 1965, and what kept him in office was a restricted electorate. Virginia was a poll tax state, so you had to pay in order to register to vote, and it was and the bird machine's control over Virginia politics was so assured that the majority of Virginians, both white and black, chose not to vote. And V.O. Key noted that turnout at the polls in Virginia was so small that the bird organization needed only between five and seven percent of the adult population to nominate its candidate for governor in the Democratic primary. Only five to seven percent of the adult population to get their um, candidate nominated. Next to Virginia, V.O. Key declared, Mississippi was a hotbed of democracy. In comparison, Mississippi's gubernatorial candidates needed the votes of from 12 to 16 percent of adults in order to win in the primary. So in most southern states, there were different factions, even though it was an all-white Democratic Party, there were different factions within those parties that meant that there was limited competition. In Virginia, there was no competition, because essentially to ascend to higher statewide office, you had to have the nod from Byrd, who then helped to mobilize officials in county courthouses, 
all across the state, but particularly in the South Side here, to turn out their voters to elect uh, their guy. Uh, this is why so often in this period, you see the gentlemen who were first attorney general aspire later and become governor. J. Lindsey Allman, perfect case in point, who was the attorney general who defended Virginia and Prince Edward County in the Davis case, uh, later becomes the governor who uh, leads massive resistance in the state in the late 1950s. So really the Bird Machine's seat of power was here in, Vir in the south side of Virginia in what was the historic fourth uh, congressional district and they relied on rural counties to, for their support. So the Bird Machine in the late 40s is again feeling defensive because of what the NAACP is doing. Um, Governor William Tuck in 1948 uh, essentially lambasts the NAACP for its litigation campaign. He's proclaimed, quote, certain persons posing as leaders of the Negro race have shocked many people in Virginia by advocating and urging the violation of the Constitution of our Commonwealth on the part of public school officials. And he's responding to this attempt by Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson to register students in Gloucester County in the white schools because the county hadn't done anything to improve schools. Segregation of the races, Tuck said, in the public schools is called for in the fundamental law. Tuck continued, it has been observed throughout the history of our commonwealth and will continue to be observed. So in 1948, state officials are saying, we're laying down the law, segregation is going to be observed, and we will fight and defend it. The, the subsequent governor, John Battle, who's elected in 1949, recognizes because of the NAACP's litigation campaign that the state actually has to respond and do something. And so they establish, ironically, what's called the Battle Fund uh, in honor of the governor, but really to battle what the NAACP and black communities had initiated. And what this did was funnel uh, state funds into the building and construction of schools. Now it's important to keep in mind in the 1940s and 1950s, schools for white Virginians weren't great either. Um, and, and particularly after World War II as outsiders, outsiders, as um, World War II caused a sort of explosion of population in both Northern Virginia and in the Tidewater of Virginia, there were white citizens who were also demanding an improvement in education in Virginia, a real investment. And so the state responds to that and they establish this battle fund. Um, and in the wake of the Moton strike in 1951, so he uh, gives a report, the governor, uh, by May 8th, 1951. And he uh, essentially says that if the Supreme Court were to rule that segregated education was unconstitutional, it would be disastrous for Virginia education. And he said, we've been working really hard to improve these schools. So how can you tear that down with some sort of declaration? The State Board of Education had indeed funneled a lot of money. There were some construction projects in 46 counties and 17 cities by 1951. And nearly half of that money was for, for African American schools. Um, and he cited that of all new construction approved or begun since the 1950 General Assembly, the battle plan funneled some $10.8 million for African American schools but 11.9 million for white schools. So there certainly wasn't a parity in funding. Um, and just to give you a sense in today's dollars, that's $106 million compared to $116 million in school investment. So there was this huge influx into school construction. This kind of construction though gave uh, NAACP lawyers pause because they recognized by 1950, uh, to quote Spotswood Robinson, that essentially what was happening through this equalization campaign was that they were just building bigger monuments to segregation. 
And so because of that, and also because of what was happening at, at the Supreme Court level, in terms of uh, some progress with uh, the higher education cases, uh, and sort of it, it appeared that a direct attack on segregation was possible. Um, and certainly that's upon the basis then in 1951, that when Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson come to meet with the students here after the strike, they say, we will, take your case, but only if we're going to challenge segregation. Um, that litigation campaign that had happened in the late 40s was really expensive to the NAACP, uh, and it took a lot of time because you had to essentially drag county officials back into court, hold them in contempt to get them to do something to equalize schools um, and to improve them at all. Okay, so that's the background context, and I think the, the important part of that is that there was clearly this dynamic between the NAACP and state officials uh, that was occurring in the years prior to the Brown decision, and that the state was already indicating that it was going to do all it could to prevent segregation from falling. This then only intensifies after the Brown decision was handed down in 1954. And there's really two phases to massive resistance in this period, 1954 to 1956, in 1956 to 1959. And I, it's sort of, 1956 is a turning point in many ways and a hinge point for this. So I want to sort of briefly, I'm watching people's eyes a little bit. Um, so I want to sort of, I will, I will kind of breeze through this um, quickly. But in May of 54, when the Brown decision was handed down, it's important to understand that there was a real sense of elation on the part of the civil rights attorneys and African Americans in general about the decision. Um, and really though, everyone was put in waiting mode because the Brown decision on the one hand declared segregation in public education unconstitutional, but they also said, we wanna have some re-arguments to understand exactly how this might be implemented. And it took the court then a year to hear those arguments from the NAACP and from Southern states. And they issued then a, a second decision called Brown II on May 31st, 1955, where they remanded the original Brown cases da back down to the federal district court level because they were closer to communities and said, that desegregation of schools should happen with all deliberate speed. And we, many of us know this history. Um, as Oliver Hill said years later, that meant a lot of deliberation and no speed. That kind of equivocation also created opportunities for resistance and for undermining, and essentially for opponents of Brown to get organized, which they did during 1954. And in the state of Virginia, initially, the governor at the time, Thomas Stanley, issued a sort of moderate statement that certainly we will figure out a plan that will allow all citizens um, you know, to get along with this, we'll be able to find a right solution, uh, that sort of moderate statement infuriated Bra uh, Byrd and his allies within the state. And uh, the sort of ardent opponents of segregation organized themselves in beginning in sort of early June 1954. You had 20 legislators who gathered in Petersburg under the leadership of Senator Garland Gray and they declared themselves unalterably opposed to school integration. This meeting in the Petersburg Firehouse that happened over time uh, that summer of 54 led to the founding of the uh, Defenders of State Sovereignty and Individual Liberties. Uh, they took their name from the inscription on the Confederate statue here in Farmville. Uh, newspaper editor J. Barry Wall of the Farmville Herald was an organizer of the Defenders and they elected as their president Robert Crawford of Farmville. Uh, by 1955, the Defenders had 28 chapters and 12,000 members throughout the state. And most of the members, they were prominent politicians, but they were based here in the South Side. And the Defenders then could really lobby politicians, and those politicians could lobby others, to really take a dramatic opposition to the Brown decision. 
And they, it's in this period in 54 where uh, Stanley, Governor Stanley, forms what's known as the Gray Commission, led by Senator Garland Gray, so you can see kind of where they're leaning already, to try and develop a plan for, for how to comply with Brown. And the commission comes out with its plan by November of 1955. And in that plan, it actually, uh, compared to later, by 1956, was relatively more moderate in the sense that it called for the organization of a, what was called the Pupil Placement Board, but it could be controlled by local counties and local communities to place students in schools. So schools would, students would have to apply to be placed in schools. The second aspect of the Gray Commission's report called for tuition grants from the state and allowed for state funds to be used to provide tuition grants to any student who did not want to attend a desegregated school and might attend a private school. What emerges in the wake of the Gray Plan, and really even prior to that, the NAACP, if I could just take a second and talk about them, because again, I'm falling into this narrative of, of sort of what white politicians did. The NAACP in the wake of Brown immediately really emphasized social action and not legal action. Uh, and they talked about how black citizens need to work with white citizens to develop these petitions, to ask their school board to desegregate. And what the NAACP's work resulted in is places, particularly in Northern Virginia, like Arlington, um, and places like Charlottesville, saying that they were open to complying with the Brown decision. So this local option plan of the Great Commission seemed to be a way forward. It infuriated opponents, obviously, of the Brown decision and ardent segregationists. And so they thought, because they believed, if integration started in Northern Virginia, it would only be a matter of time before it would seep down to this part of Virginia and destroy right, the way of life, where, in their opinion, black people and white people had gotten along together for 200 centuries, right? That's sort of what was said. The NAACP was an outside agitator coming in to destroy the lovely relationships um, that Virginians had, uh, and this sense of local control of sort of if only we were to be able to control the process, meaning whites would be able to control the process, uh, without asking African American citizens what they wanted and including them in the process as equal participants, uh, that that would achieve, uh, they, that they could sort of handle change over time. So by late 1955, the NAACP sort of gave up, if you will, on social action alone. As Roy Wilkins, president of the national president of the NAACP, described it, no responsible official or body in Virginia has given any indication that it is willing to discuss plans for desegregation, any plan, slow or fast. Oliver Hill declared, the reasonable time has passed. And so the state conference and attorneys, they knew Arlington citizens, both black and white in Arlington County, were ready to move on school desegregation. And so they went to Arlington County and said, we're ready. And by early 1956, the NAACP filed suits in Arlington County, in Newport News, Norfolk, and Charlottesville. They were ready to move. This, of course, the actions of the NAACP caused that, and did I mention Charlottesville? I think I did. Um, sort of caused opponents, they're like, here, here it comes, right? Here comes the onslaught. Uh, conservatives realize that they have to kind of do something. And so what they do in 1956, state politicians, is they launch through the General Assembly a new set of massive resistance laws that threw out the local option that the Gray Commission recommended and created a state pupil placement board that would assign students to schools, supposedly. In addition, and this was known as the Stanley Plan, it gets passed in August of 1956. In addition, they also then empower the governor to remove any school that integrated, 
They empowered the government, the governor, to remove that school from the public school system and shut it down. And the reason to remove it from the public school system was so that the federal courts couldn't sort of rule uh, that they had to keep it open. So they remove, so it gives the power to the governor to shut down any public schools that integrated. The other aspect of the Stanley Plan is it did uh, call for tuition grants to be given to students who refused to attend an integrated school and might attend a private school. Those tuition grants, in order to make those happen, required a change in the state constitution of Virginia. And so there was a referendum which uh, African Americans mobilized against. The NAACP got a big get out the vote campaign to vote no for the referendum, um, but the referendum passed and they amended the constitution to be able to allow public funds to go to private schools. And this uh, sort of launched the, the effort of tuition grants, which is another thing that the NAACP would fight, uh, particularly in the Prince Edward case, uh, through the Griffin case, and, and work against that for years, for the rest of the 1960s. Finally then, the last aspect of the Stanley Plan was to go after the NAACP. And they passed some seven laws aimed at the NAACP. And this is really part of a broader effort Southwide to target the NAACP, to get their membership lists, uh, to sh Alabama shut the NAACP down as an operating corporation in the state. Uh, in Virginia though, and this is a testament to their work, they went after the lawyers. And I don't have time and to sort of go into the details and um, it, that would really sort of engage, I think, the attorneys in the room, but I'm not sure the rest of us. Um, I, it engages me even though I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, but the laws essentially were designed to harass and discredit and cripple the organization. Um, a set of the laws, sort of a group of them, had to do with the illegal practice of law. And the other one, the other uh, required all organizations that raised money for, for racial litigation, as they called it, civil rights litigation, to register with the State Corporation Commission and disclose the names of all contributors and members. So the state starts to go after the membership list of NAACP branches. In addition to passing these laws that attempt to go after the lawyers for their work, um, and also then for uh, trying to get the membership list, they create two investigative committees. And remember, this is during the Cold War, it's during the McCarthy era of the 1950s, and these investigative committees with names called the Committee on Law Reform and Racial Activities, or the Committee on Offenses Against the Administration of Justice. Now, if that's not doublespeak, uh, I don't know what is. Uh, but they used these committees to investigate NAACP branches. They went after the Arlington branch members who advocated school desegregation. And they issued reports essentially accusing the NAACP and its att attorneys of engaging in the illegal practice of law, of sort of attempting to, to sort of stimulate social unrest, uh, accused them of soliciting clients and and plaintiff, that plaintiffs weren't actually aware that they were litigants in these cases. Um, this happened here in Prince Edward. So uh, members of these committees came down, uh, interviewed citizens here in Prince Edward for, who were litigants in the Davis case. They claimed they didn't realize that they were part of a case to um, challenge the constitutionality of segregation. Oliver Hill, Spotswood Robinson, they were put on the stand themselves to defend their practices. This was an extensive and insidious, really insidious, action against the NAACP in these years. Really all of state and power was mobilized against them. Uh, in, a, in a way that I think we, we don't often talk about when we talk about massive resistance. And I, and I think it's really important to think about that in terms of the work of these attorneys and, and the plaintiffs in these cases, uh, the, the sort of bravery they had to have and the resilience they had to have to press forward in this period um, on these cases uh, to do this. And it really put the lawyers on the defensive. They were in court 
of all the time, either litigating the school desegregation cases or defending the NAACP itself. Um, this did have an impact then on membership. By 1957, total membership in Virginia had fallen to only 13,595 people. I mean, it had, it had diminished from what it had been um, even by the late 40s. It would take the NAACP until 1963, and it takes a Supreme Court decision called NAACP versus Button for them to finally put these anti-NAACP laws at rest. And even after that, in the early 1960s, uh, the state went after Samuel Tucker and attempted to disbar him, and that was a separate series of proceedings that happened um, at, with, separate from this kind of constitutional fight. Um, and NAACP versus Button is important because it establishes essentially the right of association and the right of a mode of expression um, for the NAACP and other civil rights groups. Uh, the NAACP really kind of was able to uh, make the civil rights movement possible because of its work, its, its establishment of this as a legal, as a legal pr principle. All right, so let's culminate massive resistance, shall we? And then I will finish. Um, and I will, I'm hopefully speeding through the part that you all know best, uh, which is the fall of, of sort of the, the NAACP's cases uh, culminate in 1958 with decisions from the federal district judges to uh, desegregate schools in Norfolk and in Charlottesville. Uh, Judge Bryan in Arlington County kind of puts a hold on the case. Uh, and so it's in Charlottesville and in Norfolk and also in Warren County where the governor closes, Governor Almond by this time, closes individual schools. These are majority white schools that are closed in the fall of 58. Many white citizens were stunned and unprepared for, for the consequences of that. Uh, and so what you see happening in places like Norfolk is, or like in Norfolk, is that black citizens and, and white citizens come together to lobby local officials to do something to get the schools to, to reopen um, and to agitate and uh, try to convince the state to do something. Uh, they also work to set up makeshift schools. White citizens who were opposed to desegregation or opposed to, yes, opposed to desegregation, opposed to integration, sent their children to private academies in this period. And ultimately then mass resistance falls constitutionally in January of 1959, because it was state officials themselves who set up some, some legal tests of these laws. And so it's in January of 1959 that the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals ruled that the school closing law violated the Virginia state constitution that mandated that the state had to maintain an efficient system of public free schools throughout the state. The federal court also said that that law violated the 14th Amendment to the constitution. And so as a result of those court de decisions, and after some rhetorical defiance by Governor Almond, and then sort of acquiesce, acquiescence, it's on February 2nd that Virginia's era of massive resistance technically ended when 21 black students entered previously all white schools in Norfolk and Arlington. Uh, so schools technically are desegregated in 1959. As you all know, that's just the first chapter of what is a long chapter of resistance to Brown. And so Prince Edward really becomes the, the proving ground of the next strategy to defy Brown. So that if, you, if the governor can't close schools because it's in violation of the state constitution and the 14th Amendment, can a county close schools by defunding all the public schools and shutting all of them down? And that becomes the tactic that Prince Edward takes when it's ordered to desegregate schools in 19, in, later that spring in 1959. And it'll be on June 3rd, 1959, that the Board of Supervisors moves to close schools. This is not a new strategy. They, they meaning white politicians, uh, had been contemplating it since Brown was handed down in 54, but it sort of 
becomes the next tactic that's used and is fought out here in Prince Edward County. Um, so, quick reflections, I think. Um, one, uh, I think massive resistance and certainly this entire history makes us remember the tremendous sacrifices that people made as plaintiffs in their communities, uh, as members of the NAACP, and certainly the tremendous sacrifices of the attorneys who waged this battle. They had already been fighting for decades uh, when Brown was handed down, and they believed ardently that people would abide by the law, and, and white Virginians did not. And so it launched another generation of struggle. In addition, I think it teaches the centrality of using the levers of democracy, the courts and the law, to make change. Uh, that the NAACP really was and has been in American history, uh, and African Americans in their struggle for freedom have been sort of the people who have taught us all what it means to use our democracy to expand freedom for all Americans. Um, it is in massive resistance where those very levers of democracy are called into question. Those anti-NAACP laws try to take the law as a means of change out of the hands of people. And the NAACP fought to protect that for everyone. In addition, and, and I think people at the time understood that. I, I wanted to read a quote from... Dr. Uh, J.M. Tinsley, who is the longtime president of the Virginia State Conference, and they um, honored the lawyers in 1957 at a, at a dinner. And Tinsley observed that the lawyers have contributed materially through their work with the NAACP to make our United States of America a better place in which to live. They have, through their unselfish services, reassured and rekindled the faith of the colored peoples of the world in our democratic processes. And more importantly, if we think about Tinsley, Tinsley's quote, the NAACP also understood the centrality of education and schools to our democracy. And it is profoundly seen in our history here in Prince Edward County. And I just want to end with this quotation um, from a, a, a program guide, really. It was sort of an um, advice guide that the Education Committee of the Virginia State Conference created in, in 1961. They had a one-day conference to help organize communities to get behind the desegregation of schools. And the Education Committee of the Virginia State Conference was led by Mrs. Vivian Carter Mason, um, whose name I hope is familiar to you. She was a longtime NAACP activist, former president of the National Council of Negro Women in the 1950s, and a veteran of the Norfolk schools crisis. And they, um, they issue this, this program, and um, they quote in there a report from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund that talked about what was necessary for the government of the consent uh, to work? What was necessary for a democratic government to work? And the report says it involves more than free elections and constitutional government. If government by consent is to work over the long pull, it needs the support of a population in which the average level of education is high. And the NAACP report underlined the final words. A people that dedicates itself to free government cares about its schools as it will care about little else. And the, the NAACP concluded, these words should be a banner under which the program of the NAACP moves forward with more purpose and determination than ever. This is in 1961. The NAACP has not only a right, but a duty to function in order that true democracy might at last prevail. Education provides the key. Without it, all is lost, not only for the Negro, but for all Americans. This is important to remember as we commemorate these anniversaries in 2019 in the time we live in today. Uh, we need to celebrate how far we have come 
but I hope uh, it provides us, this history provides us with inspiration and also with uh, courage for the struggle that lies ahead uh, for us together. So thank you so much for your kind attention. I really appreciate it, and I'm happy to take any questions. I want to say that I really uh, enjoyed hearing the history. You know, I had not heard it broken down like you did. And I think that was great. I, I really appreciate that. But a serious question. You know, as we've walked through the museum and as we've heard the speakers, one of the areas of government we could always turn to, because we know it wasn't the executive, we've seen what's happened with the governor here in Virginia during this time period. We know, we know it wasn't the legislature because they were the ones who were passing the laws that were discriminating against people. We could always turn to the federal judiciary. And the concern I have today is with the people who are being appointed to the federal judiciary today, the dark period that's gonna follow when we finally do have a chance to, to change what's happening right now in the country. And if you have any thoughts at all on that, they would be really appreciated. I, um, I think that's an important point, is to think about um, uh, sort of what's happening with the Supreme Court today. Uh, at the same time, if you think about, and this is why the federal district court level is so important. If you think about who's holding the line, it's at the federal district court level. And they're not allowing certain things to happen, whether it's about immigration um, or about maintaining that finance records should be released. So I, I do think um, we, we have to have faith uh, in, in the judiciary as an, an independent uh, sort of branch, if you will. Uh, and I, I have faith that lawyers believe in that, uh, lawyers who become judges. Uh, but it, it, it is, I mean, we have, we have had dark times in the federal judiciary before, uh, and, and we've been able to navigate through them. That may be a, a sort of, um, that's a long-term view, though. <laughs> I, will, I will say over the course of American, of American history, uh, and we, we know uh, what kind of damage the federal judiciary can do. I mean, Plessy, right, despite Harlan's dissent, uh, Plessy is, is certainly was longstanding. I, I enjoyed your, your talk. It was stimulating. You know, uh, you gave me a lot of hope. You gave, you gave uh, us uh, a good uh, understanding of the NAACP and its strength. You know, it, it's, it's become, as you know, and everybody knows, the oldest civil rights organization in, in the country. You know, and some people, uh, different times of the year, will say the NAACP is not relevant. I think for those people who say that, they don't have an understanding. They don't have an understanding of the historical things that the NAACP does and has done throughout history. Those are people who have given up. Those are people who don't belong to anything. I bet, I bet if, if Mr. G had brought some NAACP membership how many people here are belong to the NAACP? Not, not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. And I, I think, I don't know the reason why, but you should join the NAACP. What other organization, what other organization in America has done the kinds of things that the NAACP has done? But uh, your, 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 your talk was outstanding. It was really outstanding. And I don't know where you got that information from. <laughs> but 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 it was it was stimulating. At our Diamond Jubilee of the NAACP in 2015, 2010, 2010 uh, Dr. Ferguson came to Roanoke and presented uh, 
the history of the Virginia State Conference to the delegates assembled. And she has done a magnificent job then. She did an outstanding job today. And we know. what information she has and is willing to share it. The question was asked about uh, Brown versus Board and the Trump Judiciary's uh, nominees. Can you answer that with respect to how they are refusing to answer Brown versus Board of Education as established rule of law? Well, I, I will say I am, there are much better constitutional scholars than me. Um, I, they are uh, based on, I mean, they're, they're using sort of their strict constructionism, I think, to sort of avoid, avoid the question is what they're, is what they're doing. Um, and so I, I think thinking about ways I mean, it is challenging of, of how we might be able to kind of press these sorts of issues um, in, in terms of the course. So that's not a very good answer, I will say, to your, uh, to your question. But I, I think we're already seeing the effects of, of sort of co the, the conservative tilt um, of the court with regard to, um, with regard to the, the Brown case.